that we will get to sing praises around God's throne. I'm grateful for our praise team and Rama and others that just allow us to be a part of that heritage with music and uh, take us to the throne of God in heart and in mind. I'm going to encourage you, if you would, to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. We've been studying through a sermon series called The Heart of the Matter, and uh, it deals with really what's on the inside of us, both cognitively as well as uh, mind and emotion. And I trust that uh, as we look at God's Word today, that uh, His Holy Spirit will impact us with the truth of the words of Christ. In previous verses, we've seen where murder was mentioned and how murder was wrong. But the issue was still one of a heart issue of anger, even if you hadn't murdered anyone. And the solution is always forgiveness and reconciliation, which is what God offers to mankind by Christ's death on the cross. And so now we're going to see the emphasis of Christ turn to another wrong, another harm against another human being in regards to the specifics of adultery. But we will see how, as Jesus was speaking to the audience to whom he was speaking, that that would have also been easily understood as a heart issue not just an action. So Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 30. If you want to use one of the Bibles in the chair pocket there in front of you, it's on page 963. And I'll be reading those verses together if you'll follow along in your copy of God's Word. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your truth. We thank you that through your word, we can be exposed to truth. And God, I pray that today our hearts would be exposed before you and that the Holy Spirit would take that truth and minister to each heart and each mind that's here this morning. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor. For it's in the name of Jesus Christ that I pray. Amen. So once again, Jesus hits the root. Yes, he mentions a specific action which any right-thinking person would agree, yeah, that's a terrible action to commit adultery. But the issue is a hard issue, just like it was with murder. Yes, that's a terrible action, but the hard issue begins with anger. So too, the resulting action is always going to begin as an issue of the heart, thus the heart of the matter. And so I trust today we will see beyond just the surface words that Christ is speaking and allow the Holy Spirit to take God's truth and apply it to our heart. I don't know why it is that humans think we can hide our true heart. It goes something like this. When you're interacting with someone and some words slip out, and you say, oh, I didn't mean to say that. You're exactly right. You didn't mean to say it but it was in your heart. Jesus made that clear. What's in your heart is going to eventually come out of your mouth. But somehow we think if we can just hide our hearts, that just by external actions, people will think we're okay. When in fact, Jesus said just the opposite, especially when it comes to worship. In Matthew's Gospel, and all of these Scripture references are listed there in your bulletin, if you don't have the chance to write them all down, but they're all listed there for you to look up at a later time. But in Matthew chapter 15, Jesus was speaking to the religious leaders, or about the religious leaders, when he said, You hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. Did you catch that? Their lips were singing the songs. Their lips were speaking the proper words, but in vain 
in vanity they thought they were worshiping Jesus Christ. And it's important that we understand that's how we can even still today try and hide our hearts. If I go through the right motions, if I say the right words, if I do the right things, then others are going to think I'm all good with God. When in fact, really what Jesus is making clear is all those externals don't mean a whole lot. In fact, he said, your worship of me is vain if your heart's not in the right place. If you can read English, you can sing the words of the song that are on the screen. Don't be fooled. That doesn't mean you're truly worshiping. It's where your heart is. And so people try to hide their hearts, and Jesus called out those religious of his day to help them to see that it's what's on the inside that makes the words or the external actions valuable. Otherwise, it's just that. It's only external actions. The prophet Jeremiah talked about the heart in regards to the people of God to whom he was prophesying in the Old Testament. And in Jeremiah 17, 9, the prophet speaking on behalf of God says this, The heart is deceitful above all things. Let me paraphrase that for you. You're better at fooling yourself than anyone else is. You can make yourself believe anything. You can convince yourself of anything. Do I need to give specific examples? Because the heart is deceitful above all else. And the prophet goes on speaking on behalf of God and says, is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Who can understand it? See, We've all probably been caught in one of those situations where we made ourselves believe something or said it enough to ourselves or tried to convince ourselves that when the reality of it came to pass, we thought, oh my goodness. Someone said to me this morning, Pastor John, are you losing weight? I said, no, I'm just buying bigger clothes. Because <laughs> here's what happens. I can tell myself and I can see myself in the mirror, but... The truth hits when I step on the scale, doesn't it? That's because in my heart, I somehow want to convince myself or trick myself into thinking, hey, I'm not doing that bad. Okay? That's why I don't wear solid red. You know, I'd look like that stop sign, you know, if I ever did. See, the heart is deceitfully wicked, though, and as funny as that illustration may be, Unfortunately, we do that on a regular basis in our lives. And we fool ourselves. What Jesus is doing all through the Sermon on the Mount, especially as we're looking at these passages in Matthew 5, is he's revealing our hearts. Yes, murder's wrong. Yes, adultery's wrong. Everyone would agree with that. The problem is most everyone would say, I haven't murdered anyone and I haven't committed adultery, so I'm okay. And what Jesus is saying, no, where's your heart? Is your heart angry at someone else? Is your heart lustful towards someone else? That's the issue, because the actions stem from there. The fruit comes from the root. And so we've got to understand how dangerous it is in regards to trusting our own heart. So we go to the Word of God. We go to the very words of Christ, as we're looking at this morning, to see how we can examine and make sure we don't fall into the wrong line of convincing ourselves of something when God knows the heart, even if everyone else around us thinks we're okay. We may not be okay. Because we, like many in Jesus' day, have become good at hiding our heart. See, the unchanged heart will always suffer the consequences eventually. And in our current culture, it seems pretty obvious to me that nowadays people aren't even trying to hide what's in their heart. I mean, have you been on any social media platform lately? I'm shocked at what people are willing to post and how sad it is. So, so our culture is making it easy 
for us to live with ungodly hearts and ungodly attitudes and blend in. But that's not the case. Christ calls us back to the truth. And the truth is, where is my heart in relationship to God? Not in relationship to others. Not in relationship... Because you can always find somebody who's doing or saying worse things than you are. That's easy. But where is your heart in relationship to God and what God's Word teaches? So the illustration of the text that Jesus is using is that of adultery. But that's the physical illustration. That's the physical manifestation of the lust that takes place in someone's heart. And so we've got to make sure we understand. And I want to point out something from studying, especially in regards to Jesus' original audience. For in the Hebrew, the word that can be translated lust into English, there's also a Hebrew word that can be translated into covet. So if you're thinking, oh, well, that's not me. I don't, I don't have that physical, passionate desire, lust to commit adultery. How about coveting? Okay. Because they would have understood those two to mean the same. And so it's not just physical actions, but it's the position of our heart even beyond the physical action or the physical action that would result from a lustful or coveting heart. And let me give you the simple definition of lust or covet. It's desiring, wrongfully desiring, what does not belong to you. So you can see that easily illustrated in the marriage relationship, right? You have a spouse, then desiring somebody else's spouse, they don't belong to you. Maybe you drive an old beat-up car, and every time you see somebody driving a brand new car, I mean, your heart just goes out to where you almost can't stand it because you want to have that car. There's no difference in the heart, the wrongful heart desire. I had a family member who had a car stolen this past week. I mean, it was parked at, near their house at night, and they woke up in the morning and through all the processes, realized it was stolen. Okay? The person who stole that car, and it was a nice car, but the physical action is going to be held just as liable, like murder, when Jesus used murder and anger, just as liable as the coveting that was in their heart because they so de desired something that was not theirs that they went ahead and took it. There's the heart issue. The heart issue is lust or coveting. And I find it interesting in regards to Scripture. So, again, let's not compare ourselves to others because you might be sitting there saying, I never stole somebody's car, so I'm okay. It's not the physical action. It's the position of the heart that puts you at odds with a holy God. And so let's make sure we clarify from Scripture. In fact, I want you to know, as Jesus was saying this, everyone would have agreed that adultery wasn't good, that it was sin. But do you know in the Ten Commandments what it says? The law doesn't actually say in the Ten Commandments not to commit adultery. What it says is you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. See why there's no difference in the external action? What the Ten, Command Ten Commandments drives home is doing that action, be it adultery, stealing someone's car, whatever it is, it's a heart issue. And the heart issue has to do with lust or coveting. That's the heart of the matter for us as human beings. And so it's important that we understand this. And this point of the law is where we find out the problem with the human heart. Jesus, again, sticking with the specific example of adultery, says everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed. So just like the anger, even if you don't carry out murder, is just as liable in your heart to judgment, so too just that evil intent is just as liable as the person who committed the action. And here's how the human heart deceives us. 
Let me share this with you. I need you to pay close attention. The human heart says, well, if that attitude in my heart is just as bad as committing the action, then we think we can justify ourselves by committing the action. I've heard it, folks. Well, if it's just as bad to think it, then I might as well go ahead and do it. The heart is deceitfully wicked. The point that Jesus is making with murder and anger and with lust and adultery is that the problem's in your heart. Yes, the physical action is bad, but where is your heart? Because if your heart's not headed there, you're not going to do that. But see, our heart, which deceives us, tries to somehow justify the action. Do you understand how crazy that is? It's crazy to think that way. But I'm concerned and I fear that too many human beings do. In the original language, again, the idea is this great desire or this focused passion with an intent to act. And I want to make certain we understand that the heart is the issue. In James chapter 1, beginning in verse 13, writing to the early church, James writes this, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Did you catch that? God cannot be tempted with evil, will not tempt you, And then verse 14 says, but each person is tempted. Haven't committed the act yet. You're following the thought process here? Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his, and the English Standard Version says, by his own desire. In the original language, guess what that word also translates to in English? Lust. So in the biblical languages, For some reason, the translators, I don't know why. Same same word. Same meaning. I mean, that's what James is explaining. Look, the problem is in your heart. (laughs) It's your heart where your mind takes over and leads you in a path and down a direction that is ungodly. That's where the issue is. And yes, in this particular instance, as Jesus is using adultery, James goes on to verse 15 then desire, or that lust, conceives and gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. You see why the importance of Christ in the Sermon on the Mount is where your heart is. Where your heart is. That's where that that emotion or that passion or that desire or that thought process is going to lead you down the path of death, literally. And so the one who looks with that, in, that intent or that purpose in his heart is what we have to check. We have to check our heart. Jesus said that such a person's heart is wrong. It's sin. It's ungodly. Jesus says that such a person's heart has sinful desire because sin begins in the heart. Again, in Matthew chapter 15, verses 18 through 20, Jesus said these words, What comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. So what's he saying? He's saying those words that you spoke, those were what's wrong. But where did those words come from? What was already in your heart. Again, bringing it back to a heart issue. Where is my heart? For out of the heart, Jesus isn't done yet. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are, those are the sinful actions, but all those sinful actions, as Jesus made clear, come out of the heart. So we must understand the heart of the matter in this regard. And so as we continue on, we see that the human heart is the issue, as we mentioned in James, because it's enticed and carried away by its own desire. And it's that sinful desire in the heart that when is allowed to come to fruition, 
goes down that path of death. So we must take seriously this position of our heart. And Jesus is presenting this idea of eliminating anything that would put those thoughts and those desires in your heart. So how does that happen? Well, he explains it by what a lot of people would just use as, oh, Jesus was just using a crazy example to tell you how you should deal with sin. I'm going to tell you, I think Jesus was as serious as he could be. Because the heart is where we must focus. So when Jesus said to pluck out your eye or to cut off your hand, he was relaying the seriousness of where a sinful heart is going to lead. It's going to lead to loss. And Jesus said, you'd be better off with that loss than allowing yourself to be thrown into hell. Well, we know the only remedy of hell is the offer of heaven through Jesus Christ. That's the only remedy. And that's why our heart is where we must focus. And I want you to know, God is the God who can change hearts. The heart's natural inclination is towards all this stuff that Jesus is talking about, towards the wrong, the sin, the bad. Proverbs 2, beginning at verse 10, says, Wisdom will come into your heart. So we've been studying the wisdom literature. Where does the beginning of wisdom? Say it louder. The fear of the Lord. You're exactly right. So where do you start with this wisdom that's going to come in and change your heart? God. The fear of God is where this wisdom begins. And Proverbs 2 tells us when wisdom comes into your heart and that knowledge will be pleasant to your soul, discretion will watch over you. And understanding will guard you. See, this is all taking place in the heart. That's why if you ever get on the verge of stealing a car or committing adultery, your heart's already taken you there. You've got to back up and deal with your heart so that your heart doesn't get you to that place. See, you're already at step eight or nine before step ten takes you over the edge. You need to go back to step one and say, God... I need to fear you. I need to trust you. What does your word teach me? Well, his word's saying, wisdom of, from him can change our hearts. So we must know and fear and learn the wisdom and the word of God. Why? Because we have to guard our hearts. Have you ex ever experienced that season in life, no matter how short or how long it might be, and you're walking with the Lord and things are tight and it just seems like God's blessing you, and it's all going good, and then boom, it just takes one thing, and you're heartbroken because you know you've wronged God. You know you've wronged maybe your fellow man. See, it doesn't take much. So that's why we must guard our hearts. As Proverbs 14, 14 tells us, the backslider in heart so Proverbs 14, 14 says, The backslider in heart will be filled with the fruit of his ways. And a good man will be filled with the fruit of his ways. So that, act, that outward act is just a result of what's taking place in the heart. And thus, the importance of this extreme example that Jesus uses of lopping off a body part or plucking out an eye. And let me tell you why... He's using such an extreme example. He's still talking about whatever you must do to guard your heart. Because a blind person can still covet. Right? A blind person could still lust. So, just because you blind yourself doesn't change your heart. But it's that physical extreme example of how serious it is that we guard our heart, that we keep it full of the wisdom of God and God's word. And so I think it's important that we understand as God called to his people time and time and time again throughout the Old Testament that his people were to be consecrated unto him. His people were to purge the evil among themselves. His people were to be holy because he is holy. And remember, from the law, Deuteronomy chapter 6, he's not just talking about external actions. The law, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, is based on what? 
loving the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and might. That's the basis of it. And so here we see the teaching of Christ about being holy because it's our heart that has to be changed and it's our heart that must be made new. And that's what Jesus Christ was emphasizing in not only the greater context, but here specifically. And in Jeremiah chapter 31, again, God speaking through the prophet Jeremiah says, Behold, the days are coming declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. Isn't that an interesting analogy that Jesus would use adultery as a specific example of a heart that wanders away from God through the prophet Jeremiah that's the illustration God's using look I called you Israel to be my people I was your husband and what did they keep doing they kept committing adultery against God that's an important aspect that we understand because those who were hearing Jesus speak these original words would have very well known that aspect of that history of Israelites, if he's speaking to a predominantly Jewish audience in his day. But the prophet Jeremiah goes on to say in verse 33 of chapter 31, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. What was the problem of the people of Jesus' day? They only saw the law as external actions. God, centuries before, was saying, look, the law is not based on external actions. The law is based on love. And based on that truth, as the prophet Jeremiah says, I will put my law within them, and he's speaking of a future day, which was what Christ fulfilled, and I will write it on their hearts. See, God doesn't want the law to be lived as just a list of do's and don'ts. God wants a love relationship, loving him first and everyone else. And Jeremiah finishes by saying, I will be their God and they shall be my people. That's the definition of the people of God. When God has occupied your heart. In fact, what was the comparison of so many of the Old Testament prophets? Even the book of Isaiah Remember what, uh, excuse me, Hosea. Remember what the book of Hosea was all about? It was about one of God's prophets who was told to go and marry a prostitute. And even after they got married and she left and went back to prostitution, God said, Hosea, you go pull her out of prostitution again and remarry her. Why? Because Hosea was told his life was going to be the example to the entire nation of God in relationship to his people. So for those of you who somehow put yourself at ease when we began by reading Matthew chapter 5, 27, adultery is not limited to a physical act in God's eyes. Every time you've turned your back on him and chased after the world, you've committed adultery spiritually. You've turned your back on God, who says, I'll be your husband, I'll be your caretaker, I'll give you my law and my spirit and a new covenant in your heart. That's incredible to me. I look around this room and I wonder how many of us men, if our wives were to turn on us as often as Hosea's wife did on him, how many of us would just, eh, let her go? Maybe not the first time. How about the fourth or fifth time? Now, in regards to spiritual adultery, do you want to try and count the times you've turned away from God and sought after the world? That's God's grace. That he would continue to take you back as his own. Isn't it interesting that in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 gives the comparison of Christ and his church as a what? A husband and a wife. That's how serious God sees it, when our hearts turn away from him. 
And so how important it is that just as this new covenant was foretold by the prophet Jeremiah, it was finalized in Christ. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 15 says, Therefore he, talking about Jesus Christ, therefore Jesus Christ is the mediator of a new covenant. What was the new covenant that that Jeremiah foretold? It would be a heart thing. His spirit and his law would be put on our hearts. So therefore, Jesus Christ is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. And since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. You know, every covenant has to be settled by, literally by death, according to the Old Testament law. Well, that's why Jesus Christ died on the cross. It was his death that instituted this new covenant. It was his death that for finalized what the prophet Jeremiah foretold. And how is that fulfilled in our lives? Remember, it's a heart issue. God says, I'll put my law and my spirit in their hearts. And Jesus made all of that accessible by his death on the cross as the mediator of this new covenant, according to Hebrews 9.15. And so in Christ's fulfillment of the law, We see a loving God and loving others change in our heart as the Apostle Paul summed up in Romans chapter 13, verse 9. You heard it read earlier, but I'll read it again. For the commandments. And this is how it plays out in our life. This is how we see it. As God has changed our hearts in Christ. For the commandments, Romans 13, 9. For the commandments you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandment, catch that? Any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. How is that fulfilled? You'll only love your neighbor as yourself when you love God first and foremost. And then when you love your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to covet their stuff. You're not going to get angry enough to kill them. You're not going like he said, all that's summed up in the commandments. That's how a change of heart is made evident in God's people. And so I'd ask you today to consider where's your heart in relationship to God and in relationship to others. I want to close with this scripture passage from, again, from the prophet Jeremiah. I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord. He's foretelling what God's going to do. And they shall be my people, and, they, and I will be their God, for they shall return to me with their whole heart. That's the heart of the matter. That's the issue. A heart that is fully and wholly devoted to God. Would you bow your head and close your eyes?